Transport Topics webinar. My name is Sue Hensley, and I'm the publisher of Transport Topics. Welcome to today's Transport Topics webinar. I'll also be serving as your moderator for today's program. Thank you for taking time out of your schedule to join us. We look forward to providing helpful information and insights that you can put to use in your own business operations. That's the mission of Transport Topics and what we strive for in this informative webinar series. The title of today's webinar is Preparing for FMCSA's Hour of Service Changes. And we've got two presenters today. Our first is Joe DeLorenzo, the Acting Associate Administrator for Enforcement for the Federal Motor Carrier Safety Administration. Joe's responsible for policy and program development for the agency's enforcement and compliance program. With over 25 years experience at FMCSA, Joe has held various positions, including serving as Director of FMCSA's National Training Center and providing training and education related to the commercial motor vehicle safety and security across North America. We also have Suna Lee presenting today. Suna is the Director of Regulatory Compliance for E-ROAD. E-ROAD is a leading fleet management technology and ELD provider with 20 years of proven experience in the transportation industry. As Director of Regulatory Compliance, Suna is responsible for understanding policy context and technical requirements and translating them for development of E-ROAD's suite of compliance products. She was named to the 2019 LEAD ATA program by the American Trucking Association and serves on multiple industry committees throughout ATA and CVSA. We'll begin our presentation in just a moment, but first a few housekeeping items. If you're experiencing any technical difficulties with either the audio or video portions of this program, you can call the following number for assistance, 1-800-785-785. 5623. Again, for technical assistance, that number is 1 800 785 5623. And here's a brief overview of our program. You can follow the presentation via the slide deck on screen. And while this is taking place, please feel free to submit questions for our speakers. You can go to the ellipse icon at the bottom of your screen, and when you click on it, a box will pop up where you can type your question, click send, and it will be submitted. And at the end of our presentation, we'll have a Q&A session and do our best to answer all of your questions. In June, the FMCSA published the Hours of Service Final Rule, making four key rule changes. With input from drivers, enforcement, and the industry, the regulatory changes aim to increase flexibility for fleets while maintaining highway safety. The changes go into effect on September 29th, so now is the time to prepare your fleet. During this webinar, Joe and Suna will explain the new hours of service changes, discuss possible impacts on your fleet, and cover how best to prepare your drivers to stay in compliance come September. And now I will hand things over to Joe to get us started. Joe? Thank you very much, and welcome, everybody. I really appreciate everybody taking some time this afternoon to spend with us to talk through these hours of service rules. Um, and so I'm just going to start by a little bit of brief background. I think everybody probably knows by now, but these are the four areas that we're going to talk about today that we have made some changes to in this new rule. Uh, the rule goes into effect on September 29th. I'll talk a little bit more about effective date and things like that as we get a little bit further down the road. But there are four provisions that we're going to discuss today. The short haul exception, adverse driving conditions, the 30 minute break requirement, and the sleeper berth provision. So we can talk a little bit now about uh, how we came about in doing these changes. And this is really important because a lot of us have had a lot of conversations over the last several years about rulemaking and where the rules come from and how do we decide what goes in a rule versus what doesn't and things like that. And I do think it's important to note that this rule, more than any other in the 25 or 30 years I've been here, is very reflective of the input that we received. And that's input across the board, from drivers, from trucking companies, others in the industry, safety advocates, all across the board, we've got a lot of input and we really worked in this rule to try and address those issues and really make them reflective of the comments that we received. On the next slide, we go into a little bit of just a slightly little bit more detail on kind of what that is like. And again, I just like to show this just kind of to reflect back on, on how we got here, um, starting back with the 2018 advance notice of proposed rulemaking. Those comments helped shape what the proposals would be. And then in 2019, we asked for folks to give us specific comments on those proposals. And that really what, what's led us there today. 
And a lot of folks look at this and be like, wow, I started all the way back in 2018 and we're not implementing it here until 2020. Well, in the big scheme of rulemaking things, that's actually pretty quick. Uh, sometimes it can take much, much longer than that. Um, but a lot of the input that we got really helped us to move quickly, come up with some solid proposals that would get through the process and lead us to where we are today. So with that, we're going to start taking each of these changes one by one. I'm going to walk you through the regulatory pieces of it. Uh, soon it's going to have uh, some things to say and uh, some questions to ask, and then we'll kind of work our way through this whole process. So starting with the short haul exception, the first thing everybody needs to remember this, a lot of this didn't change. The short haul exception is an exception from the uh, requirement to create a record of duty status, be it paper or an electronic logging device, um, or also to take a 30 minute break. That's the way it's always been. It's not an hours of service exception or an hours of service change or anything like that. It's when do you need to create that record of duty status or that law? So what we did with this rule is we changed some of the parameters, and the two are shown there on your screen. Those per parameters are the allowable air mile radius and the time of, of the maximum, the maximum time for the duty day. So under the current rule that's in effect right now, it's a hundred air mile radius and it's 12 hours in the driver's duty day. And in the new rule, we extend that to 150 and to 14 hours. One of the things I didn't mention in my introduction is that a lot of what's in this rule is designed to do two things. One, give the drivers additional flexibility, but two, also make things a little bit more consistent and easier to understand. And this is a really good example of that. There's more flexibility with the short haul driver now to uh, operate in a wider area and not have to worry about creating that record of duty status, but also the 150 air miles then is a little bit more in alignment with some of our other exceptions that maybe used to be 100 miles and now 150, like the ag exception. And also the maximum duty day now matches up with the 14 hour day for long haul truck drivers. So everybody that's driving under these rules now has the same allowable time in the duty day. And the illustrations there on the slide just simply show that this is a, a radius that we're talking about. So you have to keep in mind it does fairly significantly extend the amount of uh, coverage that a driver could have and still maintain compliance and, and operate under this exception. So I want to talk then a little bit more about um, exactly what you have to do if you want to take advantage of this exception. Keeping in mind that nothing else changed other than the 150 and the 14, uh, nothing changed in the CDL short haul, the non-CDL short haul exception as well. So therefore, where we are right now, the requirements that a driver has to meet in order to take advantage of this exception are the 150 air miles and the 14 hour rule, starting and ending in the shift in the same location, uh, 10 hours off between shifts, and um, including the start and end times for each day on a time record. I'll talk a little bit more about the time record coming up, but there still is a time record that's required. That time record can, has to be uh, maintained at the carrier's place of business uh, not necessarily on the drivers uh, on the vehicle, but I'll talk a little bit more about that here on the next slide. A couple of things to keep in mind about this, kind of to summarize this and, and kind of wrap it up, and that is that while operating under the short haul exception, as I said, the driver doesn't have to fill out a log or a record of duty status, but we need to talk about a couple other pieces that intersect here. One, just quickly, is the issue of the time record. Uh, that time record, as I mentioned, has to be maintained at the carrier's place of business at the time in, time out, total number of hours for the day. You can see where this is going because it is important to remember that even while operating under the short haul exception, a driver still is subject to all of the hours of service rules. That includes the 11 hour rule, obviously the 14 hour rule, but also the 60 and 70 hour rule. And so that time record helps to establish that level of compliance. It has to be maintained in the principal place of business for six months, as shown there. But also note that um, if a driver, a driver may be asked for that on the roadside, and sometimes an officer will want to see some verification, maybe have an email or a fax copy or something like that. So just, just be aware of that, but definitely not required to be on the vehicle per the reg. There is one more piece to keep in mind, and that is how does the short haul exception and not filling out a logbook or not needing an ELD, intersect with the ELD rule itself, okay? And one of the 
really important parts to keep in mind is back when we were doing all these discussions about the ELD rule, we talked about the 8 and 30 rule. And there's a really important point to make here with the 8 and 30 rule. And what that is, is that if you're a driver operating on paper under the ELD rule, as long as you don't exceed eight days out of every 30, and that's a rolling 30 days, you don't need a switch from paper to an electronic logbook. That was for the occasional driver that needs to have a log that um, to not have them have to have an ELD for just those few days out of every 30. Now, how that intersects with this short haul exception is simply that if for some reason on any given day, a driver cannot meet the short haul exception. For example, there was one particular customer that is a little bit further outside the radius, still can be done in 14 hours, uh, but the driver can't meet all of those um, pieces of the exception. And um, so for that day, and only for that day, the driver then has to fill out a logbook and have that paper record, bring it back, carrier maintains it at their place of business with that other time record, and they're good to go. Not a problem. As long as they are able to manage within that 8 and 30, they won't ever have to switch to an ELD. So that also is important to remind you that that eight hours, that eight days is per driver. So if you have this particular customer and maybe it's more than eight days out of every 30, you can use multiple drivers, different days. As long as any given driver doesn't exceed that exception, um, eight out of every 30 days, it should work out pretty well. You can stay on paper if you choose and not need to have an ELD. So I think that kind of wraps up the uh, discussion that I have uh, for the short haul. And I will turn it over to Suna for the next part of the presentation. Thank you, Joe. So uh, kicking off with some questions around the short haul exceptions provision. So the first question, when the short haul driver exceeds the 14 hour shift, and reverts to the interstate property carrying rules, will driving beyond that 14th hour automatically put the driver in violation, Joe? Yeah, it sure will. Uh, with maybe one caveat that we'll talk about later and one of the other exceptions that's coming up, but the 14 hour rule still applies, as I mentioned, to both the short haul and the long haul driver. So that is something that you need to be conscious of. And that's kind of why when I use my example, I generally focus on the radius as being the area that would probably be most likely to impact the driver. Yeah, exactly. So the second one, does the short haul driver have to carry anything with them for the roadside inspections? You mentioned uh, yeah. this can happen. Yeah, I got a little ahead of you there. Sorry about that. But yeah, um, uh, not necessarily. No, the rule does not require the driver to have that record on board the vehicle uh, with the caveat that I mentioned, somebody may ask for it. So how you manage that as a company, kind of is up to you, but the short haul driver will be asked if they show up without a logbook, but um, as long as they have a reasonable explanation and with the short haul drivers in particular, a lot of times the law enforcement officers kind of know the companies and where they're operating and it kind of works out well. Okay, so next question, although a short haul driver is not required to use an ELD, as you mentioned, can carriers and drivers choose to use it voluntarily? If so, do they have to present the ELD during the roadside inspection? Yeah, that's a really good question. So the first part of the question is, of course, there's never any prohibition against doing anything voluntarily. So there's a lot of different options out there with all the different ELD providers uh, as to how you might manage that short haul um, exception. And, you know, technically speaking, as I mentioned, that time record isn't going to be required to be on board the vehicle, um, but it is likely that they will be asked for it. And if they have it, they should be presenting it to the law enforcement officer. They'll probably at least want to see the display. Um, but they also can explain, and the ELD will show that, that they are operating under the short haul exception and aren't required to have it. So technically, the answer is no, but you kind of have to be able to realize that the questions are going to get asked and information will be needed at the roadside during that conversation. Gotcha. So going into this question in a little bit more detail, I um, wanted to share about, you know, the short haul exceptions and the LDs. So elaborating on this last question we are having, uh, there are carriers that we've uh, surveyed that are voluntarily choosing to deploy ELDs in the fleets for various different reasons. Um, the survey that we conducted was um, as part of the NPRM process, so E-Road surveyed customers and the wider industry on the key proposals that were outlined in the NPRM. 
And so regarding short haul, we asked the survey participants, uh, would you continue to choose to use an ELD if the short haul criteria were broadened as proposed? Uh, and this uh, pie graph on the screen right now shows the results there. Um, and so 40% of the respondents said yes, they would still continue to use an ELD even though they don't need to. 38% uh, said no, and 22% said they weren't sure at that point. So of those respondents that said yes, um, the key reasons that they uh, indicated as to why they would continue to use it were more related to business reasons. Um, first of all, for instance, um, it's a good way to keep consistency across mixed fleets. As you were mentioning, Joe, um, there may be drivers that have um, to, you know, go outside of the 150 AMR radius, for example, and, you know, may need to keep paper, whereas there may be, you know, uh, drivers that are operating under the interstate property rules, in which case, as a carrier, you may want to keep a consistent uh, methodology across all of your drivers. Uh, the second point there, um, they want to be able to keep all the hours in one place, whether it be for payroll um, or for time reporting purposes. Um, and another reason that uh, many uh, many of the respondents uh, provided was that it was a great way, ELDs, to keep mileage for IFTA tax reporting purposes, as many of the ELDs can uh, provide a system to be able to produce those records. And finally, um, help tracking around safety of the vehicle and the drivers. Um, many of the ELDs provide a lot of driver behavior um, statistics and data, such as uh, speeding, idling, harsh braking, and harsh acceleration type of thing, which can help um, a carrier um, coach the driver um, for better performance. So uh, moving on from this, um, on the, um, in terms of what an, an ELD could provide for a short haul driver, um, there are ELD solutions uh, like the eRoad ELD that have features that can help a short haul driver with their compliance. For example, uh, eRoad's smart short haul feature can automatically track and detect if a driver has gone outside of 100 air miles, which is today, but also come September 29th, uh, 150 air miles. So it can automatically track the distance. It can also help to prompt the driver around that shift limit as well, which is uh, on the right hand side. Uh, it can tell a driver how many hours they have remaining in their shift. Um, and although the driver, as Joe was mentioning, is um, using an ELD voluntarily, if the driver remains within the short haul, they won't need to show any rods or anything to that inspector. Um, but if they do exceed one of, that, one of those criteria, then the driver using an ELD will always have the ability to pull up a compliant log uh, for the inspector with all, the, all of the details automatically. So that's one of the huge benefits of um, having ELDs. Um, showing what's available on the back end side, um, there's the additional benefit of um, having drivers use an ELD, which is that it's an easier way to keep all the appropriate records for your drivers. Uh, in particular, for drivers that are using the smart short haul feature, uh, there will be an electronic time card available to meet the audit requirements. Um, it contains, as Joe was mentioning earlier, um, the time driver reports for duty each day, um, the, the time that the driver is released from duty each day, as well as the total hours on duty that they've um, worked. Um, there's also the short haul report that can show a list of the drivers um, that are operating under short haul and uh, whether they've exceeded any of the particular criteria, whether it be the AML radius, the drive limit, or the shift limit. So, you know, if they exceeded, let's say, 150 air miles come September 29th, they exceeded the 11 hours drive limit or the 14 hour shift that will um, show up on this particular report. And why that would be helpful um, is that it can help the operations to review whether the routes for the drivers are appropriate um, for staying in compliance with those rules. Um, it, it can also help track, you know, the eight and 30 days. Um, and it can also help the drivers, deter, you know, drivers and carriers determine if that driver needs a log for that particular day. Um, but since the driver is already using an ELD, um, that is also available electronically on the back end side as well. So those are some of the key benefits of using an ELD um, whilst um, voluntarily uh, on a on a short haul drive. Oh, short haul drive. So over to you, Joe, for the adverse driving conditions. Sure thing. Thanks, Suna. Um, <clears throat> starting off with this uh, definitional 
page here. There are a couple of really important things in here that go back to what I said earlier about kind of how we developed this definition and how um, it's kind of designed to work for uh, the driver and provide more flexibility there. Um, so I wanted just to take a minute to talk about the definition because we do get a lot of questions about what is the adverse drive, what is an adverse driving condition, what's not, et cetera. Um, but let's start with kind of the highlighted portions on the slide there. And really the key thing that we've done in the new definition, the definition is basically the same. Okay, it's adverse driving conditions. Uh, we all kind of know what that is, but we'll talk about kind of how it fits into the rule in a minute. Um, but in the case of, of this particular issue, it's a condition that's described there that was not known or reasonably could not be known to either a driver or motor carrier. But in this case, the real important thing here is the driver immediately beginning the duty day or immediately before beginning driving after a qualifying rest break period. Okay, if you look at the way that it used to be, it was a motor carrier at the time of dispatch. Well, as you all know, dispatch may have been three days ago, a couple thousand miles away, um, and that's not particularly helpful when you're talking about an adverse driving condition like snow or ice or sleet or whatever. So what we've done here is we've given the driver some just some uh, a little bit more discretion and flexibility in making this determination because at the end of their last qualifying rest break, whether it be a 34 hour restart or 10 hour break, or when we talk start talking about sleeper later, it will uh, give an idea of, you know, uh, that they can look at it right after their qualifying sleeper birth period. So I think that um, that piece is really an important one to remember. So as a driver, you need to look at that end of that qualifying period. Uh, what do things look like on your route? Make your determination because if there is something that you know that's a problem, then it's not going to qualify. For example, I am here in the D.C. area. I like to point out that 5 p.m. in D.C. traffic is really bad. And as a person that has to drive in it, yeah, it kind of is an adverse driving condition, but not necessarily under this definition because you could have known, you knew that it was going to be rush hour traffic at 5 o'clock at on, uh, you know, uh, here in D.C. But something like an unanticipated accident or a snowstorm or things like that that pop up other unpredicted weather, things like that, those all can be counted under the adverse driving conditions. So let's take a look at the next slide and we'll kind of talk a little bit more about what does this mean. Once you determine that you have met the definition of an adverse driving condition, um, you, uh, you do get a little bit more benefit here. The current rule uh, only provides for an additional two hours of drive time. So the current rule that we're under right now says, yeah, if you run into an adverse driving condition, again, based on that definition, which is a little bit different, uh, you can have two hours of drive time. Um, but that may not help you because then you would run up against your 14 hour clock. So this rule says, well, now we're going to add this on to the 14 hour clock and um, you can uh, have that additional time if you run into an adverse driving condition. So really important distinction there because it provides that additional flexibility. It's up to two hours based on the conditions that occurred. And under the new rule going into effect on September 29th, then you can um, have the additional two hours of drive time or up to the additional two hours of drive time as well as uh, the on-duty time. So this is just an example. I don't know that we need to spend a lot of time on this, but just kind of pointing out that uh, this is a good example of the kind of thing that happens, uh, whether it's an accident, road closure, road construction, whatever the case happens to be. Um, I also will point out there that um, it's really important to keep in mind that an annotation on your ELD or a note on your log goes a long way. Um, I've talked about this a ton when we've done stuff on ELD, uh, that using that annotation feature that all ELDs are required to have will then um, help you go down the road because you look at it kind of from a roadside officer's point of view or an investigation at the carrier's place of business, that data transfer is going to come over. Um, and uh, when that happens, uh, it doesn't 
show any other information other than the hours that were driven as well as any annotations that you put in there. So when it goes to the officer, the first thing that's going to get flagged is you are over the 11 hour rule. Okay, they're going to be like, hey, what's going on with this? Now, they're supposed to be checking. We always say uh, our system only flags probable violations or potential violations, I guess is a better word. Um, so in this case, However, if it goes over with an annotation that says got stuck in uh, in uh, traffic because there was a crash on, you know, I-70, well, that provides a little bit more information to the officer and helps to explain exactly why it's flagging as being over the hours that day. So I can't emphasize that enough. Whenever anything kind of out of the ordinary happens, uh, whatever system you're using, uh, all of the ELD providers are required to have this. Uh, the ability to put that annotation in there, doing that will really help you go a long way. Great, Joe. Um, so turning over to a couple of um, frequently asked questions from carriers. Um, for inspectors and audits, what are the best practices for carriers and drivers to demonstrate proper use of adverse driving conditions exceptions? Yeah, I really think that going back to kind of what I said, because they're going to be hard to do, right? I mean, but I do think that the best thing to do is just to put in some documentation, some notes about what happened. And if the driver does it in their ELD, then you're really covered. Because the good thing about that is that the ELD, obviously, we don't want them doing this while they're driving down the road. But at some point when they can stop and they can make that, you know, the GPS uh, markings will be there. The roads, you know, the speeds will be there, things like that. So this is one of the nice things about the ELD and all that data that comes over is we'll be able to see that for an hour you were doing no miles an hour, you were doing five or six or seven miles an hour, uh, and your GPS location didn't change very much. So all of that will be there. I just encourage the use of the annotation and some notes like that just to really kind of help out and help to explain. Yeah, I think that's a great advice. Can you apply adverse driving conditions exception with other exemptions like short haul? Yeah, you sure can. And that kind of goes back to the question that uh, we, I touched on a little bit and you mentioned uh, during the short haul discussion. Mm -hmm. it's, that's kind of a yes, but uh, answer. So if you're a short haul driver, you run adverse driving condition, well, you might need to end up having a log book for that day. Mm -hmm. Because if you go over the 14 hours, then you're, um, you lose the short haul exception. That's not a problem. Again, keep some logs in there. And, you know, you have, might have to back it up if you didn't um, anticipate what happened, but certainly that can happen. Uh, you just need to be particularly careful with uh, the short haul that it may kick you out of that exception and you just may need, as we discussed earlier, to have a log book for that day. Gotcha. Uh, similarly, can you apply adverse driving conditions exception if you're using split sleeper birth provision? Sure, and we'll talk about that a little bit more during the split sleeper. The split sleeper exception doesn't have anything to do with drive time, doesn't have anything to do with the duty day. It really only has to do with how you break up or, or if you choose to break up your 10 hours off. This is an exception to the 11 and the 14 hour rule. So that's really how you need to focus on this. So whatever you're doing, this is where that falls in in, in terms of your compliance with both the 11 and the 14 hour. Finally, um, can the carrier decide not to allow adverse driving conditions exception for their drivers through company policy? Sure, carriers, you know, that's something I always say, I don't want to get involved in that whole company policy thing. Short story is carriers can make whatever kind of rules that it is that they want. I mean, some carriers don't allow the, uh, the full amount of driving um, and that's okay. Um, so however you do that is, is completely up to you. From our perspective, we're going to evaluate it based on what the rule says. But if it's any different than that, you know, that's that's really up to the carrier to do. So you can be more restrictive than what the regulations permit. Like, yep. So um, touching on that particular part of the permissions, if uh, in terms of some of the ELD systems that are out there, um, for example, with the eRoad ELD, a carrier can actually set up the drivers to use the exception or not. Um, there is a function on the back end um, per driver. You have the controls to be able to enable that exception as well as the other exemptions uh, on and off for the driver. And when you do enable it for the driver, um, the driver has the ability to apply it for a particular day. 
um, when they encounter a particular adverse driving condition. And when they do, um, the drivers will see an update to their um, counters that are shown on the ELD itself. Um, right now, um, with the adverse driving conditions, um, that operate today with the Alza service. Um, it goes from 11 hours drive to 13 hours, and the shift remains the same at 14. But come September 29th, um, the device will show, as you see here on the right hand side, uh, the drive limit ex increases to 13, and the shift increases from 14 to 16. And the drivers will not see a violation um, unless they exceed those two um, particular parameters. So that's um, another benefit and ELD is able to help um, a carrier manage the permission and also um, help the drivers throughout the day um, to see whether they're staying within those compliance requirements. Moving on to 30 minute rest break, Joe. Absolutely. So the 30 minute rest break uh, change, this is one that's been discussed a lot. We got a lot of feedback over the years about 30 minute break requirement. Uh, so this is another one that's really important to talk about kind of where we were versus where we're going. Um, and on that 30 minute break requirement, the original, uh, the current rule says you need to have a 30 minute break after eight hours on duty. So that's on duty, driving time, you know, all of that together. Uh, so there's a couple of really important distinctions that we made in this final rule. And we are going to circle back to this again a little bit later, um, where now you only have to take a 30 minute break if you've driven for eight hours without at least a 30 minute break, okay? So as opposed to on duty time, now we're focusing on drive time. And we've also said that the 30 minute break can be satisfied by some time of on duty not driving. You could use any duty status other than driving or any combination of the other three duty statuses and combine them to get 30 minutes and get your, um, get your 30 minute break in. So if in the course of the day at any point you have to stop and load or do something else or whatever the case happens to be, then uh, you get 30 minutes on duty, not driving time somehow, you got your 30 minute break requirement covered. Okay, you stop for lunch, 30 minutes, that's the off duty, you're good to go. You stop to fuel, 15 minutes maybe, go grab a cup of coffee, another 15 minutes of, on, of uh, off duty time, Combine together for uh, for a 30 minute break, and you've got your you've got it covered. So lots more flexibility. I do think that it is very much going to eliminate the need for a driver to consciously have to take a 30 minute break, just because something will happen in the course of driving for eight hours that will cause them to be either off duty or on duty not driving for 30 minutes. You just have to be conscious of it and and make sure that you get that 30 minutes together. And again, this is just a quick example uh, that shows a couple of logs about how you can do it, either off duty or you can do it on duty, not driving. So really just kind of focus on uh, the things that I said and kind of figure out how to naturally make this work uh, in your day. And I don't think it'll be a big burden. I really think, especially when we finish the last piece of this, uh, you will see that uh, the need for a 30 minute break may be very, very uh, limited compared to what it was before. So, Joe, a couple of questions around the 30 minute rest break. Um, can a driver use on duty yard move status to satisfy part of that 30 minute break? You sure can. On duty, not driving time, as I mentioned, uh, is kind of the point is get away from that monotonous driving down the road kind of deal. Uh, so, on duty, not driving uh, time of any sort would certainly count. Great. For a short haul driver, if the driver goes outside of that 150 air mile radius and is subject to rods for that day, would they need to have satisfied that 30 minute rest break during the day? Yeah, at some point they would because now they're kind of out of the short haul exception. So everything kind of goes away, not just the paper, but the 30 minute break as well. Okay. Uh, and finally, if a driver, so this is an example. So if a driver does a four hour drive and then a 15 minute on duty work, does that 15 minutes count towards the eight hours before a 30 minute break is due? So would it count towards that counter that a driver would see until a break? Yeah, yeah, it's a good point. The the answer is short answer is no. You got four hours of drive time. You took a 15 minute break. You got four more hours of drive time. 
before you need to take a 30 minute break. That's great. Thank you so much for that clarification. Moving on to split sleeper birth. Sure. This is where the fun really starts. Um, so the split sleeper provision, I think it's important to keep in mind that is, it is one option for taking your 10 hours rest. Okay, you still can take 10 hours rest if you choose, um, and that's fine, in which case you would start over with a fresh 11 and 14. Um, but I do want to take a minute to kind of parse the words here, just because it's in regulation it gets a little bit confusing, so I want to make sure that everybody's clear as to how you do this split. Okay, the first thing is, remember what that top sentence says, you have to split 10 hours off. Okay, so that means everything has to total to 10. Okay, so your short period can be either off duty or sleeper birth and has to be at least two hours. And your long period has to be seven hours consecutive in the sleeper birth. And as I mentioned, they have to total 10. So two and eight, three and seven, two and a half, and seven and a half, I think that works. Whatever combination you could come up with that equals 10, four and seven, you know, whatever it happens, uh, you have to have a total of 10 meeting those two qualifications. If you use them together, neither one will count against the 14 hour driving window as opposed to kind of where we are today with the eight hour, the um, eight hour sleeper birth period. So let's go ahead to the next slide. I like to kind of do this by example. It's a lot easier to explain um, this way. And I'm really just going to focus on the log on the left. They're both very similar. They're two separate days. One uses a 7-3, one uses an 8-2. Um, but I want to explain kind of how this works and how you do the hours of service calculation. And I think hopefully it will make sense, um, you know, to the, uh, to the drivers and to the carriers that are listening. So on that first day, okay, uh, we're going to go over the 7-3 split. And we made it really easy. We'll assume the driver's coming off 10 hour break, 34 hour restart, whatever, starting off fresh, comes on at midnight. We like to do it that way. It's easier to count the hours. One duty of on duty time, okay, and then six hours of drive time. So everything's fine there. Driver takes three hours off, okay, three hours off duty for whatever reason. Maybe they're getting unloaded and they can be off duty or they're waiting to unload and they have three hours until their delivery time, they're taking some time off duty, get some work done, do all the other things they need to do um, until they come back on duty there at 10 a.m. for two hours of on duty, not driving time, and then another six hours or so of, um, of drive time before they take a seven hour break. So first point here is we do have two qualifying rest breaks. Okay, we have three hours off duty which is more than two, which we said was the minimum. We have seven hours of sleeper, which is the minimum amount. Seven and three is 10. So we have two qualifying split periods right there. So the driver met that requirement. Next question is, how do you count the hours? So there's a lot, people have a lot of different ways to do it, but in this case, your calculation point is starting at midnight and you count on either side of the first qualifying period. So you've got seven hours on duty on the left, you had seven hours on duty on the right, no 14 hour violation because we're at 14 hours on duty when we take that seven. Okay, you do the same thing for drive time. Six hours on the right. I mean, sorry, here I'm looking, getting, getting you all messed up. Six hours on the left, five hours on the right, totals 11, you're good to go. So if we assume then that the driver starts at the end of that seven hour, at, the, at midnight again, at the end of that seven hour break, you can ask yourself the question, how many hours do they have left? So assuming that at some point they take a three hour break, you will do the same thing. You'll count on the left and the right. And now the calculation starts at 10 a.m. So prior to leaving, the driver has already accumulated seven of hours of on-duty time and uh, six hours of, uh, or five hours of uh, drive time there, I'm sorry. So on the other side of that seven, they can have seven hours of on-duty time and another six hours of drive time before they need to take at least a three-hour break. So that's really the basics of how it works. Important to note, though, here is when you look at a log like this, you really can ask yourself that question we talked about earlier, which is, where do you need to take a 30-minute break? If you're using a split, you're probably not going to have to, because in this case, we've got some on-duty time, but we also have 
uh, off-duty time, any of those 30-minute periods are going to count for your 30-minute break. They have 11 hours of drive time, but no 30-minute break is required in that law. So that's, again, just a really quick high overview. I'm sure we'll get some other questions on that, but I just want to kind of move forward from there and, and see what uh, SUNA has, and then we'll go to the move towards the Q&A. So, Joe, um, regarding split sleep or birth provisions, um, what happens if you pair a three-hour sleep or birth uh, with a 10-hour sleep or birth rest? Sure. Good, great question. First thing that you ask yourself is, does it meet the requirements? Sure does, because the first one has to be a minimum of two. The second one has to be a minimum of seven. We deliberately didn't put a cap on that, on that seven because you can take more if you want. And in this case, you took 10. So the real benefit there for our driver is now they're starting over at, starting over after that full 10 with actually a zero at their 11 hours and a zero at their 14. Mm -hmm. So it does reset. Yep. So next question, what if a driver had completed a three hour sleep of birth on September 28th and then completes a seven hour sleep of birth on September 29th, given that that's the day the hours of service rules changes take effect, could that driver be in compliance with the new rules? Well, it depends what time they did it on the on the 28th. <laughs> uh, generally speaking, uh, the way this rule is going to go into effect is 12.01 Eastern time, um, you're going to have to, is when the, on the 29th is when the rule goes into effect. Okay. So you can't, anything that has to do with splits and sleeper and everything, all of that other stuff can't happen until after that time. Now, I make that comment just because, well, it'll be 9 o'clock or 9.01 a.m. out on the West Coast where you are. So it is possible that a driver could take a two or three hour break late that night and, and have it count towards their, um, you know, towards the qualifying split. But basically, it has to be everything that happens after 12.01 Eastern time on the 29th. So if if the driver took it, um, let's say before 9 p.m. on Western in in Pacific time, then would that three hours be taken off of the 14 hour shift? No, but then it's not going to count. Okay, I think that's important for um, the drivers and carriers to note if they do that. Moving on to enforcement and web e rods. So Joe, um, there is a website. Um, where a carrier and driver is able to see um, the ERODS, which is the system that the enforcement uh, uses to be able to inspect the logs at roadside as well as for audits. Now, uh, there is an ability to upload the file and view it in that format. And so um, this is what it actually looks like um, from an enforcement standpoint, right? Um, and so can you explain a little bit about um, what is uh, seen here because um, there are a, going to be a little bit of difference between the two, correct? Yeah, I mean, on, our, on the enforcement view, we're pulling over the raw data and it's laying it out there on the graph grid and it's putting some flags in there and some other data. So, like you can see there, there's a, um, a flag for a potential violation there um, in terms of, of the driver's time. That's what the officer sees. They also see all that data below how it was entered, whether it was automatic from the ELD or from the driver or from the mileage or whatever the case happens to be. But again, whenever these things come up, this is the start of a conversation. And then the, the officer figures out exactly what is going to happen after that. Gotcha. So going over a little bit of the questions um, around web EROs and for enforcement, um, I think we cover this, but will the EROD system be able to process the driver's ELD data so that until September 28th, uh, the night, um, will it be in the current ALSA service rules and then from September 29th for the revised ALSA service rules for enforcement? Will this yes. system update? Yes. Everything should be all good to go starting on the 29th. system will be able to kind of operate under both um, under both sets of rules. Okay, good to know. Um, and then um, currently the public web ERODs and enforcement ERODs views are slightly different. Will FMCSA make the public web ERODs view closer to the enforcement view for carriers to be able to see what the ELD file would look like to a safety official? Yeah, we're working on that all in due time, I suppose. But yes, we're gonna try and make them as close as we possibly can. 
great. Um, I think a lot of carriers are uploading files to be able to see what it would look like. Um, so that would be great. Um, turning over to implementation. Yeah, so I think we pretty much covered this. I did get a little ahead there on the 1201 Eastern time. Um, we're spending all our time now getting EROD's ready, putting additional information up on the website, and uh, we'll be ready to go on the 29th. Great. So I think you've addressed this question already. So when we say that the Alza service changes takes effect on September 29th, is that midnight for the driver in their home terminal time zone, or is it in the set time zone? Yeah, it's Eastern time. So that means that for those drivers that are um, set in Pacific or Central time zones, it may be 9 p.m. for Pacific time and 10 p.m. for Central time, correct? That's right. Okay. Uh, there are a few petitions that we see for reconsiderations filed with FMCSA. Are those likely to impact that September 29th take effect date? No, they are. I don't think they are. We're we are uh, fully anticipating that the rule is going to go into effect as planned on September 29th. Okay. And um, what are the resources that FMCSA are making available to carriers and drivers? Will there be an updated uh, logbook examples or interstate drivers guide documents? Yeah. Uh, yes, to all of that. Yeah. So we put some information up on the web. We've got some one pagers and some other sheets and things like that. We're definitely working on the logbook examples and some other tools to help folks out. So keep an eye on the website and you'll start to see that happen. Great. Okay, so in terms of implementation tips and to just summarize um, what we've covered off with Joe today, um, I think training drivers and staff on these changes um, with the materials that FMCSA will be providing, but also um, re reflecting back on some of the key points to this webinar would be helpful for everybody um, to start early. Um, updating the company policies. If you have any company policies that are uh, reflecting on some of these changes, you may want to take a look at those and revise. Um, given Joe was mentioning that you may not, you know, choose to use any of these uh, requirements and keep some restrictions. Um, if so, then make sure that those are updated in the other company policies. Um, and then check with the ELD provider on how the updates will go into effect. For example, with eRoad, um, you know, our updates will be over the air um, and we will be communicating with our customers ahead of time to make sure that they receive the right updates and are ready to go um, on September 29th uh, at midnight on Eastern time. So. Uh, make sure that those um, questions are uh, asked to the provider um, and you get the right responses about um, how those changes will take effect. So with that, we will head into uh, if they, uh, questions from the audience. Thank you, Sue. overview of these key rule changes. And again, if you would like to uh, submit a question today, please go to that ellipse icon at the bottom of your screen, which should allow you to type a question for us today. And we've got a number of questions. Why don't we start with a few that are centered around short haul, if that's okay. Uh, first question, in regard to short haul, how do you define start and end ship locations? Is it the same city to, uh, to same city, or does it have to be from a specific address to specific address? Uh, so I believe we're getting that start and end at the same location. So that means the same location. I would say based on that question, it would be kind of the address. So where you're starting from is where you should finish. I do, there's probably some exception to that. We could talk a little bit about it in a specific circumstance if for some reason. But the idea, is, you know, that maybe you're starting in one yard and maybe finishing in another, I think if that's what the question is getting at, that may be okay. The idea is that you're coming back to where you started and you're not out on a run and continuing to operate. So that's kind of a, it sort of depends on exactly what the, what the circumstances are and what that question is and what we're talking about there. Great. Thank you so much for that. Uh, another question, using short haul, uh, not only is it a violation for drivers after 14 hours, but is it a violation for being on duty after 14 hours? So, no, it's not. I mean, that's a really excellent question that gets to what the rules are. And all of our rules are about when can you drive. 
you can't drive after the 14 hour after 14 hours, whether you're a short haul driver, whether you're a long haul driver, but you certainly can continue to work. You just need to make sure that you get the break that you need, but under whatever circumstances you have, but certainly no prohibition on continuing to work. We're only concerned about the driving time. Got it. Thank you. Um, another question. Can you still use the 16 hour day rule while also being a short haul driver? Um, no, again, to the point that once you exceed that 14, at least for that day, you would have to have a logbook for that day. Got it. Okay. And we're one more on short haul. If a driver goes across state lines in that 150 miles, uh, sorry, hold on one moment. Uh, is that still, is that still covered under short haul? If they go over state lines in that 150 miles? Absolutely. Good question. So all of what I talked about relates to the interstate side of things. Um, the way that our rules work, we write the rules that are um, applicable for interstate transportation. So going across state lines, absolutely no problem at all. Uh, what happens then is the states under our motor carrier safety assistance program will uh, adopt those rules within the state for that intrastate portion of it. But short answer is Absolutely going across state lines, no problem. Great. I've got a couple now on adverse conditions. If a driver uses the adverse driving condition, will this affect the 16 hour exception? Can they use both? Um, the 16 hour, so if we're, if we're kind of back to the 16 hour day, um, I'm not sure exactly what that question and kind of how that relationship yeah. works. Um, the long, and that could be something maybe we follow up with email after, um, but the long, the kind of the short end of the, the short version of the story is it may only hit the drive time portion there because you're already getting the 16 hours. You're not going to get 18 is kind of, I think, what we're getting at. Got it. Um, does adverse drive, does the adverse driving condition allow a driver to exceed the 60 slash 70 hour limitation? Yeah, it does. It does not. I think I mentioned that briefly. Um, it's an exception to the 11 and the 14 hour rules. Got it. Can can drivers continue driving during the duration of the exception if the adverse conditions clear, like getting past an accident? Yeah, sure. So the way that the exception is intended is I, I said this a couple of times deliberately. You get up to two hours. OK, so if you're in traffic for an hour, it really should be taking just an hour to go to go uh, full, you know, to continue on an additional hour. That's the way that exception is designed. Got it. And here's a couple other questions just about adverse conditions. In the current political environment, would a protest blocking the road or unrest in a city apply to adverse dri the adverse driving condition rule? Yeah, I mean, this is again one of those things. Like, did something come up to stop you that? Um, that uh, you couldn't anticipate when you left. To me, that's kind of the same as if there was an accident that held you up, right? So just kind of look at it that way. Unanticipated event at the end of your at the end of your last qualifying rest break, the start of your next duty period, and it could fall into that. And then here's one specific to right now: Does hurricane evacuation traffic qualify as an adverse condition? Um, it could. I think you have to go back to my comment, though, about uh, and what the rule says that it has to be something that is not anticipated at the end of uh, at the end of your last qualifying break. If you're in the middle of that where there's an evacuation, uh, I'm not sure that that's definitely going to fall into the idea that you didn't know it was kind of going to happen and kind of plan around it that way. So it all goes back to that initial slide, that initial definition that we talked about. Got it. And here, one last one on adverse driving, we'll go to another topic, but can you use the adverse driving exemption if a driver is held up at a shipper or receiver? Yeah, no, you can't. Um, that's not an adverse driving condition. I know that's another kind of hot topic for folks, um, but in that case, you know, one of the things I do point out is that to the extent that it may work at some point in time to get a couple hours off duty, if you know you're going to be held up, that may be useful because you may be able to use that as part of your splits and not have it count against your 14. 
but you're not going to have it. You're not going to be able to have it work in terms of an adverse driving condition. I mean, just by definition, it's not driving, right? So that's kind of where you're going to run into that problem. Great. Why don't we uh, get into a little bit on split sleeper? When doing a split, does the full 1411 reset upon completion of the paired qualifying qualifying periods? Does it reset? So if the driver drives six hours, takes seven in the sleep, seven hours in the sleeper, then only drives three more hours and completes the needed three hours, will the 1114 reset after those three hours? Right. So the the short answer is no, but again, that deserves a little bit more explanation. So go back to the way I explained it is if you're using splits, well, let me take one step back. The only way to start over at zero on your 11-14 is to take a full 10. Okay, if you do qualifying splits, remember I went through that example where you count on either side of the first qualifying split to determine what your hours are. So it's going to continue to roll. If you go six hours on, I don't remember the numbers you gave me, but let's just go with six hours of driving, three hours off duty, five hours of driving, seven hours of off duty, then you can go to six hours of driving, three hours of off duty. So it's going to keep on rolling like that. It will only reset if you take a full 10. Got it. Thank you for that. Um, moving on, let's talk about 30 minute rest break. PC and yard news are actually time behind the wheel. Will this time count as break time under the new rule? Yes, I mean, that's a good question. So, I mean, PC is technically off duty time. Yard moves, as Suna and I discussed, are technically on duty time. So those would count as periods for um, being off duty. But, you know, we always have that. And this comes up a lot when we talked about PC uh, for a while, a couple of years ago, that there's always that overarching issue in the reg that says you got to make sure that you've gotten enough rest time. So we want everybody to kind of be smart about it and make sure you take the good breaks that you need. Great. And then I've got another. When can we expect to see an alignment of the CSA methodology with the updated hours of service revisions? Um, so there really isn't anything that has to happen with CSA and hours of service. Um, it's kind of an interesting way to look at it. We talked about this a lot during development of the rule and implementation is that nothing really changes because the violations that are out there are violations of the 11 hour rule violations of the 14 hour rule just in this example or no 30 minute break those are all the same violations that we had before it's just how they're figured and how they're calculated is a little bit different so there's really not any adjustment on the csa side that needs to be made it's more of an adjustment as to you know when is it a violation versus not great well i think we have uh I think we've asked you plenty of questions and this has been a really comprehensive overview. Uh, I'd just like to, uh, to thank you again, uh, Joe and Suna. We are at the end of our program today uh, and I'd like to thank all of you who attended today's webinar. If you have additional questions or would like to get more information, please contact Suna. You can use that, uh, some of that contact uh, info on screen or reach out to us at, uh, again, ttnews.com. Um, and if we weren't able get to get to a question that you submitted today, uh, rest assured our presenters will be circling back with you. And if you know of someone who wanted to attend today's program but wasn't able to do so, or if you'd like to go back and review any or all of today's program, we will have that available on our webinar archives page at www.ttnews.com. Thanks again for attending and have a great day.